Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Rare Book Room. My name is Nicholas, and I help direct the events here. Uh, for a bit of history about our store, Strand was founded in 1927 by the Bass family over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until after over 92 years, um, we're the last survivor, still run by the same family, the Bass family, and still housing new and used books. But you didn't come here to hear that. You came here to hear Rebecca Traster for the launch of her new book, Good and Mad, The Revolutionary Power of Women's Anger. Rebecca is writer at large for New York Magazine and a contributing editor at Elle. A National Magazine Award finalist, she has written about women in politics, media, and entertainment from a feminist perspective for the New, the New Republic and Salon and has also contributed to The Nation, The New York Observer, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and much more uh, that I did not include in here to make it shorter. Um, she is the author of All the Single Ladies and the award-winning Big Girls Don't Cry. Joining Rebecca in conversation tonight is Anna Holmes, award-winning editor, writer, author of two books, founding editor of Jezebel and General Polymath, and creative exec whose work has appeared in numerous publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the New Yorker Online. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Rebecca, Anna, and Good and Mad to The Strand. I have to be careful to walk, talk into the mic because um, I guess this is being recorded for YouTube, which makes me a little bit nervous, but it's okay. I, no, 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 it's fine. <laughs> if <laughs> things not go off the rails, <laughs> yeah. this can all disappear. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens first. Um, so one thing I just wanted to mention um, when I was overhearing the introduction of Rebecca is that Rebecca is not just a National Magazine Award final, ma National Magazine Award finalist, but a National Magazine Award winner. <laughs> um, and very, very right, very deservedly so. So, thank congratulations. You. Thank, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. Um, okay, so I have questions on my phone, so I'm gonna be looking at my phone as I talk to Rebecca. I'm not on Twitter. Um, I just want everyone to know that, especially you, because <laughs> you know that I used, to have a, I used to have a problem with Twitter. Um, so, okay, so let's start off. Uh, the book came out on, the paperback came out on Tuesday. The book itself came out October 8th, of yes, last year, it, yes, it did. I believe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 11 months ago. Uh, so the first question I want to know is, um, what have you learned about women in anger in the 11 months since it came out? So much. Mm -hmm. um, so much, because what happened in terms of the timing of when this book was published completely shaped my experience and reshaped uh, not not changed and, and, and didn't reverse in any way what I'd written in the book. Um, there is a part of me that w wishes I could have written it again um, based on what I, what more I learned, okay? And, and I think that what I learned really had to do with the timing of publication. So, yes, I think the pub date was October 5th, uh, uh, October 8th yeah. um, of last year. So, pub dates are chosen months in advance. This book was rushed. It was originally not supposed to be published until 2020 when I signed up to write a book on women's anger. Um, I originally thought of it in the last week of 2016 that I wanted to write a book about gender, race, class, power, and fury, and the role that anger had played in social and political movements um, throughout America's history. I I thought of the idea, obviously, coming out of the months post-2016 election, and I talked to my publisher about it, and, and that idea came in advance of the Women's March and um, the first Women's March and so many women running for office, um, first-time candidates, young candidates, candidates of color, left progressive candidates, many of them running out of anger. Um, and it was going to be a book I wrote over the course of the Trump administration. Um, Hopefully only one. Hopefully the idea was over the course of the Trump administration to be published, you know, probably with a quickness in 2020 in advance of the next presidential election. 
And then that year began to, and I signed my contract and everything. I was going to write this book, and I sort of started working on it very slowly. And then these things began to build, and there were the teacher strikes, and um, <clears throat> and it wasn't actually the the fall, October fifth of of uh, two thousand seventeen, when um, the first piece about Harvey Weinstein was published, and then Me Too began. And at that point. Um, my editor and I were like, we should probably do this quicker. <laughs> um, so the book was written in a huge rush. It was written very quickly over four months. I could, I could, I work full time at New York was Magazine. Was it really only four months? Yes. Oh I God. had, I had, because it had been a project I was working on and meant to work on slowly over a period of, of three years, I had done interviews. I had begun to do thinking. I had, for the for the um, proposal, I'd done a lot of writing already and a lot of, so it wasn't unstarted. But yeah, the thing, and I'm sure there are people in this room, I know there are, who have written books. The thing when you're like, now I'm writing a book, that part had not started. And um, after Me Too, I had, I could, I could sort of take four months off. I could afford to take four months from my job. And I took February, March, April, and May of 2018. And I, so I started the now I'm writing a book on February 1st and I handed in the book on June 1st and then they wanted to publish it um, for the anniversary of the beginning of Me Too and the Weinstein story and so it was scheduled for the first week of October and that was scheduled from like when I handed it in and that's the that's the date that's the date and then we went through edits and it was all very quick and it was all very quick and um, then uh, it turns out that that pub date that we picked in June uh, wound up being uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, five days after Christine Blasey Ford's testimony, and um, you know, four days before Brett Kavanaugh was confirmed to the Supreme Court. And what that meant, like the old uh, Victor Navasky line about the nation, what's good for the nation is bad for the nation, um, is that the conversation around the book and the attention that it got was, there was a lot, when I published it, I published it into a very eager and active conversation. Um, the horror, but that also shaped what the experience of publishing it was, which is that your standard book tour, which is you go to a bookstore, and you know, and I have, this is my third book, and like there are days you go to your bookstore with your book and eight people come. And then there are days that 75 people come and you're thrilled. And my experience of publishing that book in that week was that I was going to places and 300 people were coming and 500 people were coming and in a couple of cities like 900 people were coming. And I had never, this was, and by the way, like m the book did very well and on a, like I am keenly aware of the degree to which I was profiting from long-term suffering, like long-term suffering. Um, but I will also say, and this is one of the things I've learned about anger, is that like the book did well, but it wasn't like all 900 people were there about the book or there having anything to do with me. They were there because it was a place where they could convene and talk to other people who were feeling the kind of rage and confusion and horror that they were feeling. And so the thing that I learned that's in the book, but that became so much more powerful to me was the value, I, the whole book is about um, a value in expressing rage and certain kinds of rage, right? It's complicated, right? Rage exists politically in lots of different directions and is deployed by women in lots of different directions. Um, but a lot of the book is about the power of rage at injustice in response to injustice and in response to inequality. And, um, and so these going from place to place all over the country and meeting people for whom the anger, I also write in the book about anger and tears. I had no idea what it was gonna be like to be going every night and talking to people, crying, with stories of every sort that you could imagine about their, their mothers who'd spent their lives angry and how they'd hated their mothers and resented their mothers and only now they understood. About the way that they'd held their anger and about the way that they didn't understand that they're crying at their workplaces or at the news or was, was a form of anger. The, the kind of, and the value that they had from being in those rooms was in seeing that they were not alone in their anger. And that is the thing that I wish I could have, I, it's in the book, but not strongly enough because I didn't see it lived in that same way until I was out talking 
in, in this context, um, that the value of expressing anger rather than keeping it in, when you're encouraged to keep it in, and when you're discouraged, um, as, as in a million ways that I write about in the book, um, as women, especially um, women of color, vulnerable populations of women who are told in every way that their anger is disqualifying, infantilizing, makes them look crazy, um, that it's, that it makes them look ugly, that it, it diminishes their value, and so the anger and fury is kept in, they're told it's irrational, um, that it will not serve them well, and so the anger is kept in because it's not practical to let it out, but the result is isolation and, and the feeling that they are alone. And of course, like the thing that happens when you express it and make your fury audible is that other people who are furious about the same or related things hear it and say, oh my God, I feel that way too. And A, in the best case scenario, you then have the building blocks for organizing. Mm -hmm. um, but what you also have is the, is the remedy for that isolation and that feeling that you're singular alone and probably crazy for feeling the level of anger that you do. Were the majority of people who were coming out to the events during the first book tour female? I mean, the large majority? Yes. Was, was <laughs> but, but I should say not all. I actually, I actually shouldn't be so like glib about it. Um, the thing that I noticed most about who came out and we can talk about this. It was the largely white audiences, white middle class audiences. Yeah, I, I noticed that at a couple of them. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and I was really conscious of that. I was really conscious of that. Um, it was predominantly women, yes, but there were men at every every event I did. There are men here tonight, um, uh, and the men were vocal and and eager to talk and eager to listen, which um, you know. There was a point actually early on when somebody pointed out to me how eager they were to talk. <laughs> because I totally, no, this is me, like, like rabid, angry, man-hating feminist, is that I was always like, oh, it's so nice, they have questions. Like, oh, look, 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 they're so eager, the first hand's in the air. And, and I'm like, oh, it's so sweet, thanks for paying attention. And finally somebody was like, doesn't it bug the shit out of you that it's always men who have the first, qu and I'm like, oh. <gasps> Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. um, did you so, learn? I'm so sorry. None of you are now allowed to ask the first question. <laughs> did you learn anything about your own anger, though? Like, did, did, did the ways that you felt anger and, and, and process it or not process it, communicate it or not communicate it, after the book came out, change? Um, yeah. Well, I knew and talked a lot while I was out on book tour about the exceptionally privileged place I'm in as somebody who was literally paid to write about her own anger and who then was paid to go from location to location and talk about anger, right? Because one of the real things that I write about, and of course, it, 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 is, the, is the real penalty. It's not just the it's not just the mirage of like people are going to tell you you're crazy and infantile and difficult and ugly and unappealing if you express your fury. It's that there are real penalties that you will, like the risks that are, that are very real. Um, and, and everywhere I went, everywhere I went, truly the first question or the second question was how I, I am in this position at my workplace and I'm furious. And if I, and it's so, and like I, a thing that is happening that is like objectively unjust and I'm so furious about it, how do I get angry in a way that is not gonna cost me? And every night, or some version of that, like a how-to, a desire for a how-to, how can I express my anger in a way that is not gonna redound punitively to me? And like one of the most heartbreaking things I had to do every night was say, I have no guide for you because it will, like I can't tell you that it's not going to wind up costing you your job or your reputation like that's also, not it also is, is, is individual it depends on like how, how old are you what, ra what, what what race or ethnicity are right. you what right. is your exactly. job i mean you, there are certain people who can get away with right quote unquote, get away with yeah expressing right. that sort of rage and so i was acutely aware of the fact that i coming into this as a white middle class woman who is already paid to be vocal on uh, like on issues that are controversial and very difficult within many communities to raise to begin with, then was in a position to be publishing a book 
about the difficulty of expressing anger, but my ability to express that anger was not only being encouraged, it was being remunerated, right? So, and I, that's something I spoke about, but I also did, and I, and I write in the book and I talked when I was on tour about how good it, like it, it's, I have had the experience of not having to hold it in and not um, suppress it and how it feels actually physically healthy and like freeing and like you're, you can be a full person um, and that there are actual health benefits for me, which again, I emphasized in every context, I'm not recommending as like a health regimen because most people don't get that like anger biodome that I got to be in where like there was a publishing house that was gonna hand me a check when I've got finished being angry, right? And um, so, uh, but the thing that I did experience- Sorry, I'm still laughing about anger biodome. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Like there was, there was no repercussion for me. I mean, the repercussion would come like with a bad review or whatever. But like that's publishing. Like I could get a bad review for writing my book about like mice. I mean, I you know the, I don't know. I I don't know. I, just, I was thinking of like a non-angry, non-threatening. Art Spiegelman wrote a book about mice. Right. That, all right. Okay. I wasn't thinking of that kind of okay. book about mice. I was thinking of something. Anyway. Um, <laughs> That's, that's dark. <laughs> it was dark, I know. It's dark. But, but also going out every night and I, I did not anticipate, like here I was like, you know, all in my anger, um, selling my books. And I, what I didn't understand was the, like talking to so many, and truly in, in many nights, like some, sometimes hundreds of people who I would talk to afterwards who were suffering mm -hmm. with a, like their inability to, ex to express their anger or having been punished for it and the sort of intensity of it. And it, that was something that had also happened during the period of the height of Me Too when I was reporting as a journalist on Me Too. And I was receiving hundreds of emails and going to events and, um, <clears throat> and being told like, like truly hundreds of stories every day of horrifying behavior like if the people like the, the the idea that what came out publicly in me too was this flood it was like a tiny tiny tip of like what's under the surface um and that just knowing so much of what is boiling under the surface was um like took a huge it was a, like it actually did take a huge toll even like even in my super privileged circumstance like it was it was it was eye-opening, and 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 of course, again, I was talking to largely middle-class white audiences, and so the idea that there was that much suffering roiling underneath this privileged in this privileged community, like again, was like tip of the iceberg of the amount of of fury and and feeling of paralysis in the face of injustice in far less privileged communities. Um, well, this is this is a good lead into the next question, which is so I was I was rereading the book earlier this week um, and uh, noticed that you say early on that we're in you said, quote, we're in the midst of a potentially revolutionary moment. Um, so w the question is now, at what point do you think we can say def you can say definitively that we're in a moment that's ref that's revolutionary or not? Are we are we in one now 11 months later since the I book was published? Well. Yeah, I mean, I, I... It's okay, you don't have to, I mean, you don't have to have an answer. I don't, well, I don't have an answer in part because something else I write about in the book is the, the expanse of time that when we think about the periods, um, and, and I'm writing especially about United States history, which is, yeah. right? When we think about the social movements and the social upheavals and political upheavals that have marked real change in this country, um, you know, whether it's an abolition mov movement that had one culmination in a civil war and, and abolition, and then another hundred years before you get to the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, and then where it's ongoing, right? Like, the, the, um, whether you think about a women's movement that has various stages, um, many of them extending the, you know, a fight for a 19th Amendment that enfranchised some women, but not all women, then extending another, I mean, you know, another 45 years 
to the Voting Rights Act. These and and we like to because we like to flatter ourselves in the United States um, by telling a story of our history as sort of continually corrective. Like we fixed, we've been fixing all our problems, right? This, you know, we began with these imperfections, and then, um, you know, in the virtuous version of how we've evolved like you know you can see the documentaries about the various movements but what those stories that we tell in retrospect and that are often told to flatter ourselves and reassure those who are telling them or being told the stories um, that we fixed whatever problem it was they make these things seem neat and quick right so that you have the snapshot even if you think about how for example a civil rights movement is depicted and with the understanding that it was extending even in, in its modern 20th century form decades before 1955 when Emmett Till is murdered and when Rosa Parks refuses to give up her seat on the bus it is even and it is you know then it's another nine years right before you get to the to the victories of a civil rights act and a voting rights act in the mid 60s and during those nine years i think we're often told a story as if there's like a march every day and and by the way like in like there was activism every day yeah. but there's activism happening every day now that's not necessarily visible and it's in in the whole and so there are ebbs and flows and um in every movement and that's even an example that it's like a decade you know, you look at the fight for enfranchisement, for full enfranchisement, it's been two and a half centuries in this country and it remains ongoing and deeply challenged right now. But I would argue that the periods in which big expansions of enfranchisement have happened and great protections of enfranchisement have been revolutionary periods, even if they're incomplete. So do I believe we're in a period of revolution? Yes. Do I have yet any sense that it's gonna, like what its successes are going to be if they exist? And when they exist, will they happen in a year? Even if, even if an election is one, that is not a fix of what's happen. What yeah. needs to be fixed right now? Will it happen in our lifetimes? Do we have these lifetimes? Because right now we're working against a clock that previous generations of activists haven't necessarily been working against. So speaking of those previous generations of activists, um, sorry guys. <laughs> Uh, what, what, are you, what are you apologizing yeah, for? Because oh. I'm like, we're, we're all going to die. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's definitely going to happen. But um, <laughs> speaking of the pre previous generations of activists, um, you have, have told me outside of this room and, and your book and, and, t and talk in the book about the kind of either unconscious or subconscious ways or tactical decisions you made um, about how to express your anger when you were younger. Um, and I, I, I have it written down here. You, you, you called yourself a kind of wise but cool, sharp but easygoing, that you had that sort of critique. Um, and, and it was that you were trying to you know, differentiate yourself from the radicalism of the past. OK, so question is, um, you say it now that that radicalism now thrills you with a bonkers rage. So I, I, what I want to know, uh, excuse me, w within its bonkers rage, what changed? Did you just get older um, and, and, less, and less perhaps internally dismissive of, of the strategies, behaviors, tactics of, of the generations that are older than you? Did the culture change? Is this an impossible question to answer? I think it's both. I mean, I think it's both. I think that, you know, I feel in a lot of ways, like, as I've gotten older, I've gotten more invested in a, in a, radical politics, but I, I don't know if it's just age, I think it's also education, right? Like I think my ability to be, I was never, I always had sort of, you know, left ideas, but also as, as a white middle class woman who'd been fed a, a like, a, a fairy tale of, and, and believed a fairy tale about like how much better things were, even if I wanted the left politics, I also was really an incrementalist. This is a change in me like in recent years, you know what I mean? Like, so, and part of it is, is education, education about history, having my um, assumptions about race and power and privilege challenged and um, that, I mean, I feel like I've been constantly changing, but the question, my, I don't know if the answer is I've gotten older. I mean, that's like, there's a lot, there are a lot of feminists, something Gloria Steinem says all the time is women, 
get more radical with age. I actually don't think that's true about a lot of women. <laughs> um, and I don't think that it's just aging that made me that way. Yeah, I, well, think, I was using that as a stand-in for a right. lot of other things, but yeah. But I also think that, yeah, I think very differently, you know, I think very differently about like 90s politics than I did in the 90s. And I think very differently about 90s politics than I did um, a few years ago. I think, and, and what is that? Is that, is it, is it also that the events around us make clear things that were not necessarily clear yeah, could to it, me? Could it be all those things and also, and yeah. also that, that you find the demonstrative behavior of some of these women to be more thrilling because it's more accepted more, you know, like generally, and I'm not sure that it is today, but, but I, I, you know, well, I do think there are better, better models for how you can be furious and powerful instead of furious and marginalized. Now, those models existed, right? If you look, but they weren't broadly celebrated, and they're still not easily broadly celebrated. But, but they're more accessible to a wider public. They're more accessible. Public. They're more yeah. visible. Technology changes. So one of the things that happened last fall, like I opened the book with Flo Kennedy. Do people here know who Flo Kennedy is? She was a feminist in the 1970s, African-American lawyer, and like, like hilarious, foul-mouthed, livid feminist who is brilliant, and we should all know who Flo Kennedy is. And she's, she died... Um, she died years ago, and uh, and I think too few people know about Flo Kennedy. But so here was a model of like absolutely don't give a fuck anger from Flo Kennedy. But she wasn't like broadly embraced as a figure of 1970s feminism, certainly by those who came after. Um, and I opened my book with a you know, scene from a documentary where she's screaming at like the news guys at 60 Minutes at the 1972 convention where Shirley Chisholm, where they weren't paying any attention to Shirley Chisholm's candidacy. She'd come into the convention with delegates. She's a historic candidate. And um, Flo Kennedy is saying, get your fucking hands off me. The next man who touches me, I'm gonna kick him in the balls. And, and it's an incredible scene. And, and I write about how when I first saw this documentary in 2015, I was like, I was like lit up. I was like, this is what we need right now. Like, this is what we need. Like, why is everybody so buttoned up and snarky and, and like wise and cool? Exactly the way that I was as a writer. Um, we need this like unapologetic, like threat to kick somebody in the balls. And, um, and that was an experience I had in 2015, long before I thought to put it in the context of thinking about anger as, as a theme. Um, but when this book came out, that's the timer. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> when this book came out, you know, do you remember the, the, the thing that was absolutely viral, um, was Ana Maria Archila in the elevator screaming at Jeff Flake, shaking, crying, um, saying, you know, you li meet my eye in the wake of the Kavanaugh hearings after, you know, meet my eye, you, you're going to say my experience doesn't matter. And now she's not a famous, she wasn't a famous figure, but that video had reached because of social media, because there was an active mainstream furious conversation happening where that voice of unapologetic fury could spread and be widely heard and resonate for people who didn't have, who couldn't be in Washington, who couldn't go to scream and yell and interrupt the, the votes for Kavanaugh. And that was a really powerful communicative tool. And I think that is like, that's technology. It's a changed moment. It is a, it's the period of, of where we are politically and, and in terms of a con conversation around gender and power that we were in at that point. But that's like a big difference between like this archival thing about Flo Kennedy that nobody had seen for 30 years. But they would have gone viral had Twitter existed back then. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to move the conversation towards the election. Um, I want to know whether you think that the two f women, well, two of the front runners on the Democratic side, female front runners, uh, Kamala Harris and Elizabeth Warren, w how they can best strategically navigate issues around how they express their anger. And if you think they're, fr they're, they're freer to do so than they would have been, let's say, four years ago. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, 
it's it's very interesting. Yes, there is more freedom there right now. I think inarguably, there is more freedom than there has been historically for women in politics to express their anger. That does not mean that that freedom is unlimited or that there are only rewards to be reaped and not incredibly caught, incredibly steep tolls to pay. And it's, it's fascinating. Kamala Harris is a fascinating example because as a black woman, she is by many measures at greatest risk for coming off as an angry black woman. And one of the, one of the people I write about in the book at length is Maxine Waters, who is, who has been treated as though she, I mean, in the, in the stand, one of the, one of the differences, and there are many differences between how publicly angry black women are treated by, by mainstream media um, compared to publicly angry white women. Um, publicly angry white women are, you know, talked about as infantile and crazy and ugly. Um, publicly angry black women are very often talked about as dangerous, militant, monstrous. Um, and I mean, the, the example of, of that is what happened, uh, uh, the very public example of that is what happened to Michelle Obama during the 2008 race when she, you know, like truly one of the warmest public figures on the American stage, um, who when she said something mildly critical and 100% true about the history of the United States and structural racism was then depicted as angry Michelle Obama and was on the cover of magazines, why is Michelle Obama so angry? And then eventually winds up getting parodied as, um, you know, a black militant on the cover of the New Yorker Angela in a very Davis. Blitz cartoon, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so Maxine Waters has had a similar trajectory. Maxine Waters' career always began, in, and she, in, in fact, her career as a politician in California was born in the wake of um, the uprising in the wake of the Rodney King verdict, and she insisted on not calling it riots, noting that, that what was happening on the streets of Los Angeles and in her district was political uprising and fury and righteous fury at inequality and would not give in to the media's depiction of angry rioters. She has always been on the side of anger as a, and anger of the oppressed and the subjugated as a powerful political tool and something we should be paying attention to politically and not writing off as violent. Maxine Waters' career has been, this has been consistent for years, and she has been treated in the past couple years as, I mean, she has been asked, I have this in the book, I write about how she is asked about whether she's gonna kill Donald Trump. Is, are you threatening to kill Donald Trump? Um, because she talks about repeatedly, she repeatedly talks about impeaching him and has been doing so from the beginning. So there is this current live history of black women being written off for being too angry and immediately discounted and it's like such a dangerous thing. But part of what Kamala Harris is beloved for is being a tough questioner. Now, it, the, the ironies here are so intense because how is she a tough questioner? As a prosecutor, right? As somebody, like she has honed her ability to be a fierce public speaker by acting on behalf of the state often in enforcing laws that structurally disadvantage African Americans, mm -hmm. okay? And that's how she's honed this skill that she has, which is remarkable, which is for intense and ferocious takedowns of people. And that's so, there's this incredible set of ironies around what her appeal is to a public, right? Meanwhile, so ordinarily I would say she's most at risk here for coming off as angry. And in fact, when she challenged Biden, you could see the split now, yeah. and it went really well for her with Wait, some you people. You mean the split in, in the reactions to yes, her? Yes, in okay. the split in the reactions. Because I think for a lot of progressives, that was like a view, and I hear all the time, like she could take down Trump. She could take down Trump in a debate, right? Um, a, an argument I actually don't find persuasive because I think I so either. many people could take down Trump and Hillary Clinton cleaned Donald Trump's clock three times yeah, in a row exactly. and did not win the election. So, um, well, she won the popular vote, so I like <laughs> think she won the election. But, but, um, but you could see this sort of like, yeah, yeah, she can take on Biden and she's, and, and for progressives like me who are very critical of Joe Biden and his record, I was, it was very gratifying and it was incredible and she had, she, but then you also saw a lot of defensiveness from Biden fans who were like, you know, she, this was, this was wrong. It was disrespectful. It was like all that stuff, which is the t more typical response when women get angry and certainly when black women get angry. Um, so she, she's in a very complicated and I think in a lot of ways unprecedented, well, unprecedented in that, you know, she's a black woman in serious contention for the Democratic nomination. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, so what I'm curious about is how, is, is then like, 
I agree with all your with, with everything that you're saying, and I understand what you're saying. But Elizabeth Warren is who's a bit older than Kamala Harris. Is Elizabeth Warren, by virtue of her being older, of being a, a more grandmotherly type than Kamala Harris, freer to express anger? Uh, than Kamala Harris is. Let's. I mean, it, it's impossible to separate race from this, and I know that. But but I but I am curious about the age thing, not necessarily so, between those two, but uh, with women and what they're allowed to who who they're allowed to be and what they're allowed to express. Well, Warren has a different set of challenges because she is older, and she is the thing that she has working against her. I just wrote a really long story about her as a teacher and a professor. And so the thing that will be used to discount her is that she is an elite Harvard professor who is talking down to you. And there are all kinds of associations. I have in, I've been writing about Elizabeth Warren for a long time, and I always marvel at how she emphasizes her identity as a teacher, because there's so much baggage Teaching was one of the first professions where women had any authority over men, right? It was one of the first two professions that, that women, and especially middle class women, um, because working class women obviously were in a number of professions always, because working class women have always worked, but one of the few professions that middle class women could enter. And of course, it's a profession, in early primary teaching, where they were permitted a kind of authority, an evaluative authority and a punitive authority over their students, including boys. Right, And so there's a line of feminist thinking that I've heard many times that's like, wh why do men resent powerful women? Oh, because it reminds them of their mothers who had authority over them or their teachers who had authority over them. So Warren has always emphasized her teaching and al always makes jokes on the trail about like having assigned her dolls homework when she was a kid. Like <laughs> She just loves talking about how she was a teacher. And when I first started hearing her on the trail, I was like, I don't know. I don't think um, because I think that's, if she gets angry, the thing she risks immediately is being that teacher who yelled at you, who you resented so much because she embarrassed you, right? And I think that's, you know, men and women. Um, so she has that risk. But you'll note, it, well, she's striking a weird balance too because her, she talks about anger all the time. Mm -hmm. But she does it always while smiling and very energetically. <laughs> in, in her like, um, Midwestern way, yeah. <laughs> yes, um, but she will say, I mean, she says, she's, Warren has always, she's like, she never curses, but there's, a, there's something from several years ago when she'd like, you know, disemboweled somebody like Tim Geithner or somebody on the, on the floor, and somebody said critically like, it was, she just left blood and teeth. And she smiled and she was like, I don't see anything wrong with that. <laughs> I wish I had the direct quote and I don't. But like, you know, so, um, but she has also gotten, you know, Mika Brzezinski has said about Elizabeth Warren that there's an anger there that's shrill and unhinged. Okay. <laughs> I have so, so many things to say about Mika Brzezinski, but I won't. Sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I think, I mean, I, I, it's not a clean answer to either of those. I think they both ha will have to be angry. Mm -hmm. There's no way to be a forthright politician in this moment without, if you're going to be fighting for a Democratic nomination and, and for a progressive politics without being absolutely livid right now. Well, there is no path where you can really do that. Really, though? Because, like, oh, oh, I mean, I realize it was 2008 was a different time, but there was plenty of reason to be angry then, and Obama did not go there. <laughs> he wasn't allowed to be angry. Either. No, no, I, I know. Like, I, know I mean, but, but, but this, but and neither was Hillary. Like, this is one of the things I, I, I quote because I talked to Hillary about this while I was I was profiling her for New York Magazine after she lost the election, and I was already working on the early. This is one of the early interviews I did where I was already talking to her about these things and about anger, and women. And again, I think this especially applies to white middle class women. Elizabeth Warren and Hillary both fall into this category. Especially especially those born, you know, in the early first half of the 20th century, were just told from the beginning that their anger was like practically a sin. It was wrong. And she talks and wrote, wrote in her own book about like being so angry that night in the debate when Trump was like stalking her and thinking about could she turn around and yell at him and, and knowing that if, and doing the math in her head and knowing that if she did, it would redound negatively to her, that she'd be the bully that, you know, she would be shrill and unhinged, there'd be something shrill and unhinged about her, right? And so just swallowing it down. And um, Obama ha obviously had to do the same thing. Look at what his, you know, and his wife bore the brunt of a lot of that, yeah. right? Um, 
there were there is a power structure in this country is incredibly like anger from the most powerful figure in a given configuration is understood as strength often as virility right um as passion anger from those so anger on behalf of power is often considered a virtue we don't even think of it as anger it's power it is it's something we are trained to respect and admire anger that comes from anybody on the margins um, is a threat to the power structure and is therefore uh, ugly, unnatural. Um, it is threatening. It's the thing, even if, even if power, even, and it very often is, even if the power of the most powerful is, is violent and punitive, right? This is, the, and I write about this in the book, in police killings. This is, this is where I first began to see how this worked as a pattern. Um, after Freddie Gray was killed in Baltimore, um, and Freddie Gray, as many of you I'm, I'm sure remember, was taken on a rough ride. He was a black man in Baltimore who was taken on a rough ride by police um, and died as a result of his injuries from that rough ride in the back of a police van. And afterwards, there were protests after his death. And the news coverage at the time all led with the violence started when protesters threw rocks. And this was a moment for me of real clarity because I was like, I, the, for a media, and it wasn't like, it wasn't right wing, it was, it was CNN, it was the time saying the violence began when protesters threw rocks. And what uh, should have been obvious to me long before, but this was the moment that I first thought about it in this way, is that the violence when it was done on behalf of power against the less powerful, when it was the police who killed a black man, is not discernible as violence, that's just power. That's just power and how it works. But when power, when, when, when it's in reverse of how the power structure works, when it's people whose only available weapons are rocks to throw at police cars, then it is the threat. The threat comes when aggression or anger is happening in a direction that doesn't correspond with how power is supposed to flow. And so, and that's true once you start seeing it that way, like it, like it sort of explains <laughs> everything. And so those who are not only on the margins, but also deploying their anger. So, so white Republican women and, and white women standing up against school segregation, right? They're not a threat. Against school segregation or for school? Oh, they, they were a huge threat against, I, I'm sorry. What, you I probably you, you meant for school segregation. No, the white against women, white women against desegregation, right, right, sorry, against integration. Um, the, um, their, those women are protecting their homes, right? Um, so when it can be, now, as women, they are marginal, but they're acting on behalf of the power structure. Um, they're acting, you know, in concert with the powerful to keep, to act against the less powerful. And so they're not seen as disruptive. Phyllis Schlafly, who led an army of furious women to defeat the ERA in 1982, was not seen as a disruptor. But the feminists who were pushing for an ERA were disruptive. So it's the, the way that the anger gets framed depends on the position and the direction of the person who's expressing it and on behalf of what they're expressing anger. And that will have, I mean, that will be, that will constantly shift within a presidential race, depending on who, who's in what kinds of positions of power. Um, I'm gonna ask you one more question and then we're gonna uh, take some questions from the audience. And this is a, a, hopefully a, a quick question with a fairly quick answer, but it has a, it has a little like preface. Um, about 17, 18 years ago, I published a book um, that was a, a anthology of women's letters written at the end of relationships. And, and a lot of them were angry, but not all of them were angry, because not all women are angry at the end of relationships. Um, but the title was Hell Hath No Fury, because the publisher thought that would, that would sell books, and I, I, I don't think it did. <laughs> <laughs> However, but one thing I did notice, and the impetus for doing the book was that, as a woman expressing anger, and the idea for the book came because I wrote one of these letters, uh, the expressing anger in writing was a, was a much more, I felt, powerful, cathartic way to express anger, especially to a man, because he could not interrupt you. 
He couldn't gaslight you. He couldn't do any of the thing. He, he couldn't. He couldn't recast the situation or pivot to another part of the conversation. And so, what I noticed was, was that women seemed to write these sorts of letters more than men did, oftentimes because they'd felt silenced in the actual relationship. Here, they got to have their say. What I want to ask you about about is whether you feel that by writing, by being a writer, and by writing about anger, even if it's not about anger, but it's about politics and women and gender politics and racial politics, if that is a if that is somehow a safer way for you to communicate what you need to communicate, because you cannot be interrupted. Now, you can have people commenting at you in the comment section or tweeting at you, but they cannot interrupt you in the actual moment in which you're having your say. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. It's, and I miss, and I have to say that um, I miss writing this book because that was what I got to write this book, even though it was four months, but it was also, I got to know I was writing it and then I got to be editing it and I got to, you know, and I got to knew, know that I was gonna, and it, it's not about my anger, right? There's not, I mean, there's like two pages where I talk, what, maybe. Like it's about the history of anger of other people, but it, it meant that I got to take it seriously and I got to funnel my fury into a piece of writing and, and my own education about, about the nation's history and how fury motivated some of its, um, some of the most revolutionary improvements we've made here. And it was, and I miss it. I miss it because it was a chance I could like burrow into my writing when I was furious, when you didn't, like when all the wrong people were winning. And I've, I've felt that so acutely the past couple of weeks, as you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, there are periods, you know, where you just, and there's big periods where you just, like all the wrong people are winning on big and small scales. And, um, to be able to feel like, like in the smallest way, like I'm gonna get to say what I get to say, like is a is, and getting to be a writer mm -hmm. is is an extraordinary privilege because you get to do that professionally. And I, I I miss I miss writing this book. Yeah. Well, I I think I can probably speak for everyone in the room that it would be it would be great to have you write about the experience of having written the book. Now, <laughs> now, I don't mean I don't mean the actual writing of the book, but the but the eleven to twelve months that have in, passed, and, and and some of the, you know, the answers to the questions that I asked about um, what you've learned, uh, both about yourself and about women and men. Um, I think that would be really clarifying for a lot of us. So I'm going to go to questions. Um, we have, uh, yeah, thank you. We have a mic. We have a mic in the back, so raise your hand. I see a hand right here. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm wondering, when you were out on the road and um, the white middle class women that were coming to talk to you, um, were they all progressives? Were there any kind of people on the redder side? Or what did you find? Um, I was really startled, given that they were white middle class audiences, um, that there was less pushback than I expected. Um, because a lot of m the strongest pushback that I get in my work and my journalism is from white middle class women. Um, I don't know if it was the nature and the timing that made the people I was pleasantly surprised that I didn't get more like, but not me, I'm not, right? Because I, you know, a lot of what I did talk about, we, we were talking about um, white women's, not just complicity, but agency in upholding a white patriarchal capitalist power structure um, and the benefits that we derive from it. And I expected a lot more like, but I'm, you know, Red Audrey Lord, and it's not it, and um, and I didn't have that, and I don't. That doesn't mean that it is not a like an active and pernicious force. It means that I think the particular crowds who are being drawn were probably again, it was an unusual tour. It wasn't really about the book, and um, I think the crowds that were coming were crowds in many cases that were in a distress that could only have been experienced if you were really invested in this from another angle, but um, there were some, there was certainly some. Um, I got just excoriated in Minneapolis um, at the end by a, a woman uh, in her, I believe in her 80s who 
like waited till the end of the line, a very, very long line, and then climbed on stage and tore me a new one for not talking more about men and their experiences and, and like the way that white men have been vilified. Like that was, I mean, she was l furious with me from a, from a distinctly other political anger, uh, angle. Um, and there were lots of smaller versions. That was, she was particularly memorable. Um, I, did, I got much less pushback than I thought I would. Um, there's a question right here. Yeah. Hi, um, I was just wondering, when, when you briefly said, the, like jokingly, we're all gonna die, but the idea that there's so much to focus on right now, I think sometimes anger can be like clarifying and help you focus on something, but sometimes it's, you're so angry at so many things, I guess it's so intersectional that it's so, sort of like blinding and paralyzing. I don't know if a how-to question might be annoying, but how, how do you differentiate between the kind of paralyzing anger and the more focused anger? I think so much of it has to do with communication and connection with other people because um, feeling the anger and expressing the anger is especially, um, it can be useful most especially when it is um, in concert with or you're learning from or talking to other people. And that's one of the things that I feel like I learned about how crucial um, the communication is. And so in some ways, I, in some instances, I think um, there are so many things to be angry about and the more you express them, the more likely you are to find other people who share your anger in certain directions and then you can begin to work together, which makes it more useful. Again, whether, you know, whether that's through activism or education. Um, I think that the other thing I, so I, I encourage people to talk with the other people around them about what's making them furious and then to think about how to find more people who are furious about those things. And again, whether that means going to meetings or whether it means going to the library or, and you know, there are all kinds of, of ways to take to, to, and I don't, I don't mean to transform the anger. I write in the book that it's not about like lots of people who, talk about having been angry and they're like, but then I turn my anger into action. And I'm like, no, 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 the action is the anger, right? We don't have to pretend that we changed it into something less upsetting. Um, uh, but I, I think that that can be useful. I would also say that I, I cannot recommend enough um, reading and, and not just reading, like watching documentaries, like, like learn, listening to podcast, like learning the history, learning the theory, whatever it is that you're drawn to. So the various things that we're angry about, sometimes take the anger as a question. Like, I'd like to know more. I'm like, like I'm so furious about this. Um, in many cases, there's a long history that we haven't been taught of other people, even if you're not finding people in your community or your social circle. One of the revelations, I think, for me and for a lot of people who read the book, and one of the things I heard most frequently, was that there, we are never taught that once the anger, like anger has been used to motivate every single transformative social movement in this country's history. But we are never taught about the anger as catalytic or even that it was there at the beginning. And yeah, that's like, we I, I, think, I think there's two great examples in the book of this. It was both Susan B. Anthony and then Rosa Parks and, and, and the ways that they were sanitized or their actions were sanitized or whitewashed or, or diminished in a way. Totally. Rosa Parks extremely polite, tired seamstress, right? That's how I was taught, that's how I was taught about Rosa Parks. I was never taught that she was a lifelong furious fighter for, for civil rights and for women's rights and that she was an investigator for the NAACP who went into communities and, I mean, it wasn't until the dark end of the street that, that I learned the history of Rosa Parks as an organizer who investigated the gang rapes of black women by white men in, in the Jim Crow South um, for the NAACP. And, and I didn't learn, and in, during the civil rights movement, women within the civil rights movement were advocating furiously for a fuller picture of Rosa Parks, right? This wasn't, this isn't just, you know, it, women within the civil rights movement were angry during the march on Washington, right? I mean, and and part of what they were angry about was about the way that Rosa Parks was being publicly depicted within the movement as as demure, right? That she was so one of the great 
set of lessons for me, if you're seeking connection, it may be connection with people in your communities. It may be connection with people that you might go out and, and participate in activism with or organize with or, or somebody at work who it turns out was also having this shitty experience with the boss or like whatever, whatever that shared thing is. But you can also um, let your anger take you toward investigating those who've come before you who I can assure you probably were angry and who I can also assure you you were never taught were angry. I want to pick someone over here because I've been ignoring this side of the room. I'm sorry. Is there any, are there any questions over here? Hi. Um, so you talked a bit about how the perception of anger changes across the lifespan a little bit. Like as people get older, you know, you might think of them in a different way. What are your thoughts about the anger of like the youth right now? Because I feel like there are a lot of people who were 14 in the last election who'll be able to vote now, and they have a lot of other challenges like climate change and the Parkland students. What are your thoughts about how they can like harness that emotion into power? I think they are harnessing it into power. I think what you're seeing is a generation of politicians. I mean, look at, look at the squad, right? Those are young women who are deeply unafraid of being angry. Um, look at Greta Thunberg, you know? Um, look at the Parkland kids. And these are all examples. And, and if, I mean, I am angry. And I'm angry, you know, in the wake of these kids and listening to them, they are inciting me in anger on their behalf. I would be livid as a 15-year-old who everybody sort of blithely says, like, the young people will fix it. Screw you. Like, are you kidding? I'm 15. You broke this world. And now you're going to tell me that I have to fix it. Um, I think that young people are furious and have every reason in the world to be furious. And I think that one of the challenges, in, and what, this is one of the things I hate about the like, the like, oh, snowflake social justice warrior. Like, I get it, right? You know what? In every era, angry people can also, it, it is also true that angry and politicized people can be annoying, <laughs> right? Like, sure, also welcome to every family, right? Like, great, what an, what, what an insight that sometimes anger can not be usefully expressed. You know what else is not always like beautifully expressed? Love and exhaustion and like, right, is it, right? So, but I hate, I, I do hate the sort of writing off of young people's anger. Um, because it is, it is so grounded. It, who has more reason to be furious right now than a generation that is about to inherit and take responsibility and suffer in this world that their elders have broken and refused to fix? And so I think it's incredibly powerful. And I have no idea what the voting patterns are going to be, right? Like people want to, you, you will watch a uh, thousand television shows between now and November 3rd and on every one of them somebody's going to come on and tell you how the young people are going to vote and not one of those people is going to have the slightest idea about how young people are going to vote. We don't know the answer to how it's going to translate electorally um, but I know we can already see it translating in electoral politics in a generation of politicians of candidates um, and activists who are just plowing forward, completely unafraid to be furious and tell the world that they're furious. Can we do some more questions? We've got time for a couple. Okay, there was someone over here who I kept skipping over like in the, in the bed, was it you? Okay. <laughs> this person? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. This person. Um, I'm wondering, you mentioned that earlier in your career you were afraid of being labeled as radical and I'm wondering how you think journalists more widely can engage with activism and organizing efforts while still sort of maintaining their um, status as journalists and not being criticized for being advocates or activists themselves? That's a great question, and I don't, there's not a neat answer to it because I have tremendous freedom as somebody who, um, from the start of writing about feminism, which I started doing, I guess, like, uh, 15 years ago, um, I was an opinion, like I, I was trained as a reporter and then I began to write feminist opinion pieces. And that's meant that I've had a tremendous, and I've, and I've had a, 
you know, my career arc has been a very lucky um, and priv privileged one. And um, I have had a tremendous freedom that a lot of journalists don't have in that I, it's not secret. Like, I, I can't tell you right now, like, who I support for president. Like, there are certain things I'm not, I can't do, like, for all kinds of reasons. But I can, it's not a secret where my politics lie, and it's never, it never has to be a secret. That's not true for a lot of journalists who are doing, in many ways, similar kinds of pieces that I am, who are profiling politicians. And they're, like, they can't tell you that their politics are, you know, left feminist. Um, so, I would like to see the notion of journalistic objectivity blown to smithereens because I don't think it exists and I think it's a fantasy that it's some um, journalistic imperative. It certainly didn't used to be. Like journalism has gone through many phases um, and the notion that being a journalist means that you have to be opinion free is horseshit. Um, but just because I think that doesn't mean that the editors of the New York Times or the Washington Post think that. And, and so you have a whole population of journalists at various places whose ability to do the job that they want to do, which is report and tell the story of the world, would be imperiled if they were too vocal about their opinions. And it's a real, it's a, it's a bind. And there's not a solution. I do think that the expansion of media um, in part thanks to social media, um, means that there is more room for journalism that, that has a voice and an opinion. And I think there are more jobs than perhaps there used to be in that realm. And so that's a good thing, but it doesn't solve the problem across platforms. Um, someone right here. One last question right here. Um, so I, I apologize if this question is unfair to you. You're welcome to not answer it. But um, so completely apart from um, the conversation around male anger, was there anything, any other topic that you made a deliberate decision not to discuss in the book that people sort of said, oh, this, this, this should be part of this discussion and where you said, no, this has no place in the way that I think about a anger? It wasn't so much um, topics that I didn't think had a place, again, I wish I could have written this book forever. I wish this book could have just been 10,000 pages and covered every angle around anger that, because in fact, I would have liked to have written about male anger, right? I would have, a lot of questions that I got when I was on the road was like, here you are, um, you know, writing about the value of anger, but let's talk about Donald Trump's anger. And the book doesn't, it acknowledges an ability of certain kinds of people to express anger in ways that are valued, and, but it doesn't delve in any depth into the way that anger on like expressed by the powerful at the less powerful is a, a, a incredibly destructive force i and that's not because i didn't want to it's because there wasn't room or time in the kind of book that i was writing by the same token i do write in the book about for example the stuff i was talking about phyllis schlafly women's anger um often the anger of white women middle class and working class white women on behalf of conservative white patriarchal politics. Um, but that is a much smaller percentage of the book um, than the way that I trace uh, anger on behalf of progressive ideas. And um, that, do I, reg I don't know if I regret it. I, it. That was a choice I made. I obviously, I write about it in the book. I acknowledge it. It's something I've talked about a lot on the road. Um, it felt to me like I would have had to do an entire other year's worth of research into, and they're incredible books that have been published recently on this topic um, that have that have done that thinking and and work. I have some mild regret about that that I didn't emphasize more the way that women's anger, some women's anger, has been deployed against um, the the very kinds of movements that I am by many measures like celebrating in this book. Um, so yeah, the, but, but most of the things that I didn't include that I wish that I could have are choices that I made because it wouldn't, the book would never have been finished because I, I truly do think that so much of the history of our politics and social change is a history of anger um, in one way or another. And that it's like one of those lenses that once you look through it, you're like, oh, I see, I see this all in a different way now. and. Uh, you know, and it, I'd almost like to retell the entire story, thinking about anger 
you know, as, as the line that connects so much. Um, and, but to have done that in full would have been a project that would have been my life's work. And maybe it will be, like in a longer term sense. Maybe I'll just keep writing about this forever. <laughs> um, but for this particular book, I couldn't. Um, can I ask one question of you, which is, uh, what are you working on next? <laughs> I, can, I can retract the question, if you'd like. <laughs> no, this is a real, this is like my, would you like to hear about my midlife crisis? Um, <laughs> um, a lot of what I'm working on next, I've never felt so at the mercy of the external world. What I work on next really depends <laughs> on, I mean, in the sort of immediate future, on whether the Democratic nominee is Joe Biden <laughs> or not. <laughs> like that, that changes my whole, like that changes what I do for the next two years. Year. <laughs> and then, what am I doing? I don't know. Um, thank you for, for, for being here tonight, and thanks for everyone for coming out and supporting the book and having some great questions. Um, one thing I don't know the answer to is, are, is, there, are the, is there a signing now, or, did it, or is there a pre-signing? Pre okay, well, so, there, so there's a see. signing now. Okay. Yes. Okay, great, great. Um, and that's going to be right here, I'm assuming. You're thank doing you. my job for me. All right, this is great. awesome. Um, um, yeah, thank you. Can we give them one more round of applause? Anna and Rebecca, thank you. Thank you both so much for having this conversation with us tonight. Thank you. Um, hey, folks, it's me again. Um, if you recall what I said earlier about the rose, we're going to do that whole thing. But just give us like two minutes.